Good morning, everybody. Yes, it is morning where I'm at. This is Reverend Karen, and I am coming at you from the back 40 of the Woogie Ranch here in Northern Nevada. And I want to welcome you to Fearlessly Feral Living, where today I'm doing something a little different. Instead of just the audio podcast version that I normally do for my podcast, I'm also doing a video version. So the vi audio video version will be uploaded to YouTube and the audio only portion will be uploaded to Fearlessly Feral, the, the podcast. Try and say all of that really fast. It gets confusing, I know. Both on YouTube and on my podcast to make it simple. And I'd love it if you would subscribe to my YouTube YouTube channel. I'm trying to build up membership there so it gets more views. So today's episode is a very, very special one. It's where we put it all together. If you've been listening to the podcast, you know that I have been engaged in a series, a four-part series of doing the Introduction to the Science of Mind textbook. The thing itself, what it does. Um, oh my goodness, I just drew a blank and I'm speaking from my head here. I learned how to not to do that. Um, and the last por portion is how to use it. And today we are talking about how to use it. And it's putting all three sections together. So today, how to use it. And this stuff is the beginning foundational stuff of science of mind. That's, and it's in the beginning of the textbook. And I encourage you to read it for yourself. It's the introduction with four parts in it. And I guarantee it. If you apply the principles outlined in the introduction, your life will become liberated. So I want to do my little introduction here. Welcome to Fearlessly Feral Living. Broadcasting to you, yes, from the Woogie Ranch, out here in the back 40 of northwestern Nevada, where I'm a half an hour away from the nearest gas station and the nearest grocery store. My mission is to teach practical application of science of mind principles to provide a strong and unshakable inner foundation that facilitates long-term successful living. So I'm feeling moved here to tell you a story about my own introduction to this teaching, this rich, liberating teaching called Science of Mind. My father was a Science of Mind minister and a practitioner. He became a practitioner when I was six years old. This was back in 1960. So if you do the math, you know how old I am, if you care about such things. And while I did not see him a lot growing up, he managed to throw a few tidbits my way during the times I did see him. He told me that my thoughts had power and that God is within me. Later on, as an adult, he gave me two memorable quotes. The first one was, old beliefs are like old newspapers. They're good for one thing only, to line the birdcage. I always loved that quote. And I'm going to talk about those old beliefs here as we move on. The other quote, I think he told me this because he knew that my self-esteem wasn't where it quite could be and that I did not quite believe how much good could come to me if I only believed it. He said, there will be a lot of doors opening for you. Just don't stand behind them when they open. So if, you've, if you don't have any doors opening for you in your life, check out what your beliefs about yourself are. Check out how much you think you deserve to have beautiful, wonderful doors opening for you. And then when they open, don't stand behind the door. So you can take those quotes and ponder them for a bit. And I, rec I highly recommend you do so while I move on. So I was never indoctrinated with the separation theology of Christianity. There was no teaching of the sort of moral code written by men whose only purpose was to control the populace. My dad simply demonstrated the power of our thinking. Until the day he died, he demonstrated the power of thought. I am not kidding here, you guys. When I tell you I saw that man fix snowblowers and washing machines. One time I asked him to treat, do affirmative prayer for, 
the quick but fair sale of my commercial building, which had been on sale for months and I hadn't even had a nibble. He did the treatment. I had an offer the next day. I was in escrow within a week. That's the power of our thoughts. And if you believe that thought can't be that powerful, go back to that quote on old beliefs and see how your beliefs are outpicturing in your life and decide whether or not you want to change them. Then there was my mom who worked graveyard shift through the weekends. And when she was doing that, she sent me to live with a Catholic family while she worked. This family insisted that I attend church on Sundays and preached a code which they definitely did not live by. Now, I'm not generalizing here. I've met some absolutely wonderful, glorious people who were Catholics. I've I've done a lot of work with the Catholic Church. When I owned my photography business, I was the one that photographed their confirmation and communion ceremonies every year. And I got to know those people really well. The teaching is beautiful, but there's an element there that doesn't fit for me. Let's just put it that way. And this particular family, yeah, they preached a code they preached that moral code that they picked up on Sundays. By the way, I don't know how they did that because the masses were done in Latin back then. But they didn't live by that code. And they did, did stuff that made no sense to me. They made me eat, eat fish on Fridays. Now, guys, this was in the 1960s in the middle of Nevada. You don't eat fish in the 1960s in the middle of Nevada. It did not taste good. Today I eat fish, it's better. I still live in the middle of Nevada, but things have progressed a bit. So I didn't understand all this stuff that they were trying to tell me. And when we went to church on Sundays, I had to get dressed up and wear a covering over my head. And I knew there was something wrong with that picture. It wasn't until many, many, many years later that I recognized that as misogyny. I just knew there was something wrong with it. So this family would, you know, they took me in, they, they let me stay with them during the weekends and part of the week. And it was not fun. They would make me go to church, but then they would hide porn magazines behind the toilet and get drunk and get at fights and allow their kids to bully me. And I saw the hypocr hypocrisy in Christianity and I wanted nothing to do with it. So I grew up wanting nothing to do with Christianity. It got real interesting when I was introduced to the 12 steps and the Christian language in the steps, but that's another story. I managed to come to terms with that in my own way. Fast forward, I'm in my 40s. I've been in successful recovery for 10 years, and a crisis happens in my life. And because of the 11th step of recovery, I knew that the way through this crisis and into the gift at the other end was to deepen my relationship with a God of my understanding, which, by the way, was still within me, not something outside and separate from me. So I went to my local center for spiritual living, although they weren't called that back then. They were called churches of religious science. And I grabbed hold of this teaching with the same energy I used to spend grabbing hold of the bottle and with the same energy I spent grabbing hold of the 12 steps in Alcoholics Anonymous to learn how to live sober. I came to this teaching with all the energy and devotion and addictive personality that I could bring to it. I came for help with my depression, with the betrayal I felt from this divorce that happened in my life. I got all that and so much more. They don't call this the thing a liberation theology for nothing. I came to my local center for spiritual living and I wasn't much interested in going to church on Sundays for some very practical reasons and also a bunch of other reasons. Um, back then I still didn't play real well with others and fellowship had no, no interest for me. I had fellowship in Alcoholics Anonymous and that was enough. But the classes, oh my God, the classes, those classes were wonderful. And with each class I took, it worked me from the inside out. And from the very first class I took, 
I knew that I was going to go on to become a practitioner, which is like a spiritual coach. I didn't know how I knew this. I just knew that I knew it. And I learned not to question that stuff by then. So I started taking classes. And with each class, I became more and more liberated, more and more free. Each class, I got to learn to live life a little better, a little more joyously. I didn't set out to become a minister. That was a natural progression of taking all of those classes. My point here is that this teaching truly is a liberation theology. And if you apply the foundational principles in the introduction to the Science of Mind textbook, you too will be liberated. I guarantee it. <laughs> Like the car salesman, or the, no, that's the, the, the big and tall men's uh, clothing salesman. I guarantee it. All right, let's move on, shall we? Here's a recap of the first three sections. The thing itself is God. It can be called by any name you wish, and it's not separate from us. The second section is called the way it works. It. This thing called God can only work for us by working through us. And it only works as much as we believe it will. And refer back to that quote about old beliefs. The third section is called what it does. And in this section, we get this quote. We can know God only in so far as we become God. Now, what does that really mean? In plain, non-jargony language, there is something, some energy or force that we can call anything we wish. It is a part of us, and thus we can use it. And we use it by going within and getting fully and completely in touch with our innermost selves and embodying this thing. And embodying means to personify, to exemplify, to give form to. So we take the attributes of spirit and we internalize them and we act them out in our lives. Okay. Another word for that in 12 step language, we practice these principles in all of our affairs. That's what that means. The last section is the one we're covering today, how to use it. And here is where, as Holmes says in the very first sentence of this section, we put all this theory that we learned about in the first three sections into practice. Holmes said, one of the great difficulties in the new order of thought is that we are likely to indulge in too much theory and too little practice. This isn't like going to church on Sundays, guys. This is about learning these principles and applying them in your life. Now, Holmes encourages us not only to just read this stuff, not to just take the classes, but to practice these principles, to live them and to do them, to be them, to embody them, to take them into your consciousness so that they become the default setting in all situations. He doesn't ask us to do this blindly. He first asks us to experiment. He says, apply these principles for yourself in your life just to see if they are true. He doesn't ask us to have blind faith. He wants us to learn it and feel it for ourselves. Go ahead and try it. Just experiment with these principles, with applying them in your life. You don't have to believe them yet, although you kind of do in order for them to work, but practice with them. See if they work. If they don't work, you can go and find something else that fits you better. This section is where he also comes full circle from the very first sentence in the introduction. He said, we all look forward to the day when science and religion shall walk hand in hand through the visible to the invisible. So here again, he's giving us an example. In science, in order to prove or disprove a theory, we experiment. And at this point, the theories in the first three sections, they're theories. So now he's asking us to conduct a scientific experiment to provide the proof that, proof that they really work. 
He suggests that we use these principles to demonstrate scientifically for ourselves that our thoughts have power and that what we think has the potential to manifest as physical reality. Go ahead and try it out. You might remember from some of my other podcasts that thought plus feeling equals power. So just a willy-nilly thought passing through your head isn't going to manifest into physical reality. But a pattern of the same types of thoughts coupled with emotions that usually come accompany such patterns. Now we're talking power here, guys. So take a look at the patterns of your thinking. Take a look at the feelings that you're feeling with those patterns of thought. So if we're thinking negatively, guess what? If we're a pessimist, guess what? It, re if it, re it really is true that we are what we think. And if you have that belief that if anything can possibly go wrong, it will, guess what? It will. On the other hand, if you have a belief that life is beautiful and abundant and glorious and full, guess what? If you're an optimist, guess what? I'm lucky. I used to live life one way. I lived life in survival mode. I was a pessimist. I knew shit was going to happen. And I was geared up to protect myself as the best way I could. I lived life like that until I got sober. And then I changed everything. But I know what it was like. I remember what it was like. And I took what I knew so far about this teaching that my thought is powerful and God is within me. And I learned how to live sober. And then when I got that under my belt, I learned more. I went deeper with this teaching. And I had an opportunity once again to change who I am and how I show up in the world. And I see the difference between the me that I am today and the me that I was over 37 years ago. I see the difference. It's beautiful. So I have proved these principles to myself. I proved that they work. Now, back to the science stuff. I enter ministerial school and we have got a whole section on quantum physics. Now you might be wondering, what does quantum physics have to do with liberation theology? Well, quantum physics proves that what we teach is true. I was ecstatic from my first class. I was like, oh my God, what we teach, it really is true. Here's scientific proof that it's true. I was just overjoyed. So yeah, there's scientific proof that what we teach is true. So here's what Ernest Holmes lays out for us in this final section of the introduction. It's kind of a jargony sentence and it's, I'll explain it after I read it to you. He said, it's apparent intangibility is lessened whenever and wherever anyone actually demonstrates the supremacy of spiritual thought force over apparent material resistance. Basically what he's saying is our thoughts are intangible. We can't grab hold of them with our hands. We can't smell them. We can't feel them. But Well, we can feel them inside, but we can't feel them with our senses, with our fingers. That's intangible. But when we apply the power of our thoughts over the material world, stuff happens. Our thoughts are supreme over the material world. They have power over the material world. So that's all that sentence means. It's But it's a big deal. It's not an all. It's a big deal. We, we talk around here about change your thinking to change your life. Yes, we change our thinking to change our life. This is why I so strongly advocate spiritual practices to change our thinking. Yeah, I, I nag about it. I really do. I nag about it. What's your thinking? How can you change your thinking? But I want to insert something here. When someone comes to me with a problem, I don't pop up with, well, what were you thinking? A matter of fact, that. That is so shame-based, guys. Oh, my God. Don't do that. Don't do it to yourself and don't do it to other people. That's not how this thing works. There's something much deeper and much more beautiful with this thing. But 
here's where I go with this. When someone comes to me with a problem, my response is always some version of, okay, what are you feeling? That's the spiritual practice of personal self-awareness. And then I ask, what's the invitation here? What's the call? I had someone resisting me once when I asked her what the call was. She said, I don't understand that. I, I said, it's an invitation. She said, oh, you mean like a catalyst? Yeah, it could be like a catalyst. Uh, everything that happens in our life, if we choose to use it as such, can be a catalyst for us to step into something greater. I also ask, what is up for you to learn here? So those, con those are about the spiritual practices of contemplation and meditation. And then, what would you like to feel instead? And what would you like to see happen in your life instead? And that's all about treatment, affirmative prayer, which I'll go into in a little bit. But I want to I want to kind of follow the way Holmes lays this out for us here. Next, he talks about the law. Now, simply put, the law is the pathway between thought and manifestation. It is the creative medium. It's the middle section of the teaching symbol that you see behind me. You see that right there, that, that teaching symbol back there? That's the teaching symbol that you see behind me. It's the middle part of that symbol. That's the law. So we have our thoughts, they go, they move through the law, they go down into manifestation, and then they go back up into spirit. The teaching symbol is beautiful. I wear it on a necklace around my neck. And I also have it on this brand new nifty tattoo that I just got last week. See that? I'm pretty proud of that tattoo. Anyway, here's a quote from the glossary of the Science of Mind textbook. Now, if you ever want to look up a word, you just go to the glossary to the Science of Mind textbook. The, the definition of law, kind of long, but it's powerful. And I think it sums it all up. It says there is only one law. Our misuse of this makes it appear that there are many laws. Whatever we think, believe in, feel, visualize, vision, image, read, talk about, in fact, all the processes which affect or impress us at all are going into the subjective state of our thought, which is our individualized use of universal mind. The law is a blind force. And whatever goes into the subjective state of our thought tends to return again as some a condition. And he refers us to the chapter on control of conditions. Yes, there really is a chapter called control of conditions. It's also in one of our belief, we believe statements. We believe in control of conditions. Oh, yes, indeedy, we do. He also refers us to the chapter on the law of attraction, the law of correspondence, karmic law, etc. So I get it. Some of the stuff I'm proposing here. We can only know God insofar as we can become God. We can control conditions. Some of that is so counterintuitive to everything we have been taught our entire lives. The resistance to these kinds of things is huge. I encourage you to at least consider some of these concepts. At least think about them. And play with them. A little bit so I teach a lot of classes and I love watching beginning students play around with this principle that our thoughts control our conditions and one of the first things that they usually play with is manifesting parking spaces it is so much fun to watch these guys do this go ahead and try it so imagine your destination picture it where you're going in your mind Picture that perfect parking place. You know, you might be going to the store and the store has this huge parking lot and you don't want to park in the back 40 of the parking lot. Well, some of us do. I park in the back 40 because I like to get the extra steps, but some of us like to park as close as possible. 
Imagine a parking space in that parking lot, that very one where you're going, and having it open up as soon as you arrive right there, willy-nilly, able to just zip right into that parking place. Imagine it, picture it in your mind. If you can do a visualization, do it. Feel your delight at having that parking space be available to precisely the same time as you arrive. Feel it in your heart, feel your joy, feel the positive energy of knowing that this perfect parking space is an omen of more good to come because you deserve it. Just try it and then go and claim your parking place and, and report back to me how that little experiment works. Now, this is kind of superficial, but it's always been a pretty good test of proof that this teaching works. And then Holmes says this, if we believe that it will not work, it really works by appearing to not work. Yeah, if we don't believe in this stuff, of course it's not gonna work. So give yourself a chance. There's a reason why you're listening to this podcast. You're not here because you just didn't have anything better to do. There's a reason you are here. Take a look at this stuff. Give it a chance. Okay, onward. Holmes said we should learn to control our thought processes. And here's another whammy in this teaching. We have been taught that we are the victims of our thinking for so long. I hear people say all the time, my thinking gets me into trouble. My thinking got me here. My thinking, blah, 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 this and that. Oh my God, our thoughts are not the boss of us. We are the boss of them. And yes, we can control our thinking. And honestly, life goes better if we do, which is why spiritual practices are so important. That's why going within and getting to know ourselves is so important. It's why learning to identify your feelings is so important. Learn what you're feeling. Know that your thoughts have great bearing on your feelings. And that if you can change your thoughts, you can also change your feelings and vice versa. This is another reason why I'm constantly advocating going within. Holmes also talks about changing our consciousness. Now, in the glossary, consciousness is described as mental awareness. I'll never forget. So when I went to ministerial school, it was a graduate program, an accredited master's degree program in, get this, consciousness studies. And people used to say, what the, what's that? What the hell is consciousness studies? Yes, I have a master's degree in consciousness studies. It's mental awareness. I have a mental awareness master's degree. I just love this teaching. I just love it. So onward, this fourth section of the introduction, it's the longest one. And trying to distill it all down into a podcast episode means just briefly touching on the important parts, just enough to hopefully inspire you to investigate further. In this section, Holmes gives an example of how to use the principles he lay, lays out to change one's life from limitation to abundance. It's basically the same process that I talked about with finding a parking space. Read that section, read the experiment he lays out for you and do it. That's all I'm gonna say because this is getting a little long and I need to move on. Holmes then says, there's no process of healing. There is a process in healing. This process is the time and effort which we undergo in our realizations of the truth. Now, let's take healing. Healing from what? Anything you want. We can heal physical illness. We can heal grief. We can heal sadness. We can heal depression. We can heal pretty much anything we want to heal. My dad, I mentioned it, he healed broken snow blowers and washing machines along with a lot of other stuff but there's a process in healing. There's a process we must go through in order to affect that healing. Now it can happen quick, just like that willy nilly, or sometimes it might take a little longer. 
For example, the process of healing my low self-esteem, coming from thinking I was lower than a steak's belly in a ditch, that one took years. The process of changing my mood from grumpy to joyous, I can do it instantaneous, instantaneously. It takes minutes or less than minutes. The process itself never changes. The time it takes to do it can happen instantly. And that's the power of this teaching. We can do a treatment and affirmative prayer and see results instantly. It doesn't have to take forever. Sometimes I look at how long therapy takes and I'm like, oh my God, I can just do a treatment and have it be done right here and right now. Yeah. These spiritual practices that I keep harping on and nagging about, they're really powerful. And Holmes talks about in this section, meditation and treatment. And it used to be that these were only the only spiritual practices we taught in this teaching. Unfortunately, that led to a level of spiritual bypass that was quite harmful. Today, we have expanded the teaching to include the consciousness, the mental awareness piece. And I'm so grateful for that. Meditate? Yeah, sure. Go for it. Treat? You betcha. But take the time to process things, to go within and ascertain what you are thinking and feeling without judgment, by the way. And make this an integral part of your practice on a daily basis. Do that first. Then use meditation and treatment to change the thinking that needs to be changed. Go ahead and get some outside help if you need to. Use a practitioner. That's what they're there for. They can help you get to the level of belief and find out, well, what am I believing about a, th a thing in my life that's giving me problems? They can help you get to that level and turn it around. But do it all, as I said, without shame or blame. No shame, no blame. Take that out of your vocabulary. Oh, and a reminder, treatment. It's our name for affirmative prayer. It's a five-step process that I've outlined in other episodes. Briefly, here it is. God is, I am, it's done, thanks, bye. It's a recognition that God is. It's a unification with that God. It's making a statement of what is so in the present tense and in the first person. I, not, not anything else. Expression of gratitude. And then we release and anchor with those words that you will always hear in Centers for Spiritual Living and Worldwide. And so it is. Every foundation class we teach. Teaches, includes treatment as a spiritual practice. It's powerful. I do treatments daily. So you might be curious about my specific practice, my process that I use, my process in healing. Here it is in a nutshell. Personal self-awareness, contemplation, treatment, study. Personal self-awareness, contemplation, and treatment in that order. Study, I do it willy-nilly all the time. I've got a zillion books. I study all the time. I get outside help with necessary. But notice, all my work is done inwardly first. That's what I have found to be most effective. I go within. The point here is for you to know yourself enough to know what works for you. That means getting these foundational principles down so you can move on from them. You know, when I used to be a photographer, I took a lot of classes and I had one lady tell me once, Karen, you have to know the rules in order to break them. And I can't tell you, you know, at, at the time it frustrated me no end, but now I understand it. These foundational principles, we need to know them. We need to know them so that they become our defaults whenever life happens in our world. So here's a repeat. God is, I am, it's done, thanks, and bye. And to wrap it all up, here's a repeat of what the first three sections are about. The thing itself is God. It can be called by any name you wish, and it is not separate from us. The way it works, it 
this thing called God can only work for us by working through us. And it only works as much as we believe it will. What it does, we can only know God in so far as we can become God. And I'm going to close with this statement that Ernest Holmes wrote in the textbook at the end of the introduction. It's beautiful and it makes me good, feel good every time I read it. A new light is coming into the world. We are on the borderland of a new experience. The veil between spirit and matter is very thin. The invisible passes into visibility through our faith in it. A new science, a new religion, and a new philosophy are rapidly being developed. This is in line with the evolution of the great presence and nothing can hinder its progress. It is useless as well as foolish to make any attempts to cover this principle or to hold it as a vested right of any religion, sect or order. The truth will out. The spirit will make itself known. Happy are we if we see these things which from the foundation of the human race have been longed for by all aspiring souls. I thank you very much for listening and for watching if you did the YouTube version. I thank you very much for your support. Your support allows me to do these things like record these audio video sessions and all the stuff that I do. And I am knowing fearlessly feral living for me and for you. Fearlessly Feral Living is a focus ministry of Centers for Spiritual Living, and thus your support is fully appreciated and also tax deductible. And you can support us in a number of different ways. If you listen to the podcast on Buzzsprout, there's a little link there that says support the podcast. It's real simple. You can donate by going to our PayPal page, and you can get more information at our website fearlesslyferal.org. Once again, I am knowing fearlessly feral living for me and for you. Thank you very much.